We're going to go over what the row echelon form of a matrix is, as well as what it isn't. We'll contrast it with the reduced row echelon form, and we'll look at several examples of matrices and determine which form they are in. We'll finish by transforming a matrix into row echelon form. Chapters are in the description if you want to skip around the video. A matrix is not the same as its row echelon form, however a lot of important properties of a matrix can be determined easily from its row echelon form, which is what makes it so important and so useful. So let's see the definition, and there is an example of a row echelon form matrix here on the left. To be in row echelon form, a matrix must have the following properties. First, if a row is not entirely made up of zeros, then the first non-zero number in the row is a 1. You can see that in this example, the first row is not all zeros, and the first non-zero entry is a 1. Same thing with the second row, it's not all zeros, and the first non-zero entry is a 1. Unfortunately, this isn't completely universal. Some texts will exclude this restriction and instead wrap it up in the definition of reduced row echelon form. The definition on Wikipedia, for example, does not include this restriction, whereas the definition in the Great Linear Algebra textbook by Howard Anton does include this restriction. For my purposes, we will include this restriction in the definition of row echelon form, but just make sure you're aware of what definition your teacher or textbook is using. By the looser definition that you would see on Wikipedia, for example, if we change this one to a two, this matrix would still be in row echelon form. Anyways, moving on to property two. All zero rows are at the bottom of the matrix. You can see that in this example, we do have a row of all zeros and it's at the bottom of the matrix. Finally, property three is that in any two successive rows that do not consist entirely of zeros, the leading one in the lower row occurs farther to the right than the leading one in the higher row, and we can see that in this example. This creates a sort of staircase pattern. We have two successive rows that are not all zeros, and in the second row, the leading one occurs in the second column, which is further to the right than the leading one in the above row. That one occurs in the first column. And note, in a definition that didn't have this first restriction, the third property would not talk about leading ones since the leading entry doesn't have to be a one, it would just talk about leading entries to be more general. Also, it's important to know that row echelon form of a matrix is not unique. You could perform a sequence of row operations to transform a matrix into row echelon form and then do it again using a different sequence of row operations and get a different row echelon form. The properties that are indicated to us by row echelon form, like the rank of the matrix, would not be any different, but you could get different matrices. Row echelon form is not unique. Now let's contrast row echelon form with reduced row echelon form, since that can cause a lot of confusion. For a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form, it must have these first three properties, and any definition of reduced row echelon form will require this property one, that the leading entries of non-zero rows are ones. They've got to be leading ones. But then for reduced row echelon form, we would also have this additional restriction that each column containing a leading one has zeros in all its other entries. And the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is unique. Let's look at some examples now of matrices and determine if they're in row echelon form or reduced row echelon form, or neither or both. These examples are from the Anton text I mentioned earlier, link in the description if you're interested in checking that out. Here is our first problem. We've got the three by three identity matrix. This matrix is in row echelon form, but it's also in reduced row echelon form. So we'll write RREF for reduced row echelon form. In fact, any matrix in reduced row echelon form is also in row echelon form, since reduced row echelon form is just a stricter set of conditions. We can see that this matrix is in reduced row echelon form because, for starters, the leading entries are ones. There's no row of zeros to worry about putting in the bottom of the matrix. The successive rows have leading entries that come further to the right than the above rows, so like this one in the second row. 
is further to the right than the one in the above row. And finally, each column with a leading one, like this column here has a leading one, consists of zero everywhere else. And that's true about all of these columns. So it's in a reduced row echelon form, as well as the weaker restrictions of row echelon form. By similar reasoning, this next matrix is also in reduced row echelon form. You can check those restrictions for yourself. The only difference here is that there's a row of zeros and it is appropriately moved to the bottom of the matrix. This next matrix, C, is also in reduced row echelon form. You can see, again, just to point out one of the properties, we've got two successive non-zero rows, and in the second one, the leading one occurs further to the right than the leading one in the above row. Matrix D here is also in reduced row echelon form. We do have some action going on over here that is more than just ones, but it doesn't violate any of the conditions of reduced row echelon form. In each column that has a leading one, all the other entries in those columns are zeros. This column here does not have a leading one, so it doesn't need to have zeros everywhere else. The next matrix, matrix E, by similar logic, is also in reduced row echelon form, and similarly matrix F is in reduced row echelon form. If in matrix E we swapped the third row and the fourth row, then we'd have a row of zeros that isn't at the bottom of the matrix, and so it would not be in reduced row echelon form or ordinary row echelon form. As for matrix G, this is not in reduced row echelon form, but it is in plain old row echelon form. It's not in reduced row echelon form because we have this column that has a leading one, but it doesn't have zeros elsewhere. It has this negative seven. So it's not in reduced row echelon form, but it is in row echelon form. If this leading one in the second row was changed to a two, then by the definition I'm using, this would not be in row echelon form because we have a non-zero row with a leading entry that isn't one. But by some definitions, this would still be in row echelon form if you don't require the leading entries to be ones. Finally, how do we turn a matrix into row echelon form? Well, thankfully, every matrix can be transformed into row echelon form, and all it takes is a sequence of elementary row operations. And this is a process called Gaussian elimination. I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson of mine more dedicated to explaining this, but it's worth going over one example in this video. We see this matrix A is certainly not in row echelon form because, for example, these two successive rows are not all zeros, but the leading entry of the second row does not occur further to the right than the leading entry of the first row. They both occur in the first column, so we have some work to do. The first elementary row operation we'll do is to subtract two copies of row one from row two. So this just means row two will now equal itself but after having subtracted two copies of row one. If we subtract two copies of row one from row two, well, two times two is four, so the four minus four gives us zero. Two times three is six, so that's gonna be zero. Two times four is eight, and that's zero. Now we have a row of all zeros. So for our next step, we'll swap row two and row three. That way we get our zero row at the bottom of the matrix because we need that. Then we'll also subtract two copies of this row three from row one to get rid of this two in the front. And there we have it. We took two copies of row three away from row one in order to get rid of that leading two. Two minus two times one is zero. Three minus two times three is negative three. And four minus two times one is two. Then we just swapped rows two and three to get that zero row at the bottom of the matrix. Remember, in successive non-zero rows, we need the leading entry of the below row to occur further to the right than the leading entry of the above row. So we'll swap rows one and two here in order to fix that. Now we have a leading one, and then this leading negative three occurs further to the right. Now by some definitions, this would be in row echelon form. However, by our definition, it's not because this leading entry is not a one. So to make it a one, we'll perform one more operation. We'll multiply row two by negative one third. 
Now, negative one-third times negative three gives us positive one, and negative one-third times two gives us negative two-thirds. And now we've transformed A to row echelon form. Again, it's not the same as matrix A, but it does tell us some important information about A. For example, the rank of matrix A is two, because its row echelon form has two non-zero rows. Maybe you know what that is, maybe you don't, link in the description, but it's useful. I hope you found this a useful explanation of row echelon form. One more time, for a matrix to be in row echelon form, it must have these three properties. Any non-zero row must have a leading entry of one. All zero rows must be at the bottom of the matrix, and in any two successive rows that are not all zero, the leading one in the lower row must occur further to the right than the leading one in the higher row. Once again, the first property is sometimes not required. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Link in the description to my linear algebra playlist, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Yeah.